What's cool about this is this shit is saving straight to the NAS network area storage oh, device. Oh, that's perfect. So yeah. it's building, it's saving as it's saving it's building a file. Exactly. That's great. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's how one of our systems at work works. Nice. Yeah, so we're, the other one does not. Oh. Which I don't get it. Well, we spent a fuckload of money to get the studio back in order. So now it's in order. It in the better order than it was before. Right. right. There you go. Yes. Now it's in better order than it ever was before. And hello and welcome to Idiots with Instruments, the show that follows Red Hot Rebellion as we do stuff and make jams and be pretty people. My name is Jim Tramontana. I am the lead vocalist and bassist of Red Hot Rebellion. I'm Doug. I play guitar. I'm Andres. I uh, play the drums. Yeah. Doug's not in, the, in any mood for this bullshit today. It is a fine Sunday morning. It's hot as balls. And we're going in the studio in like two weeks and we are way behind. That's two weeks. You're right. Yeah. So That's we're, terrible. We're, we're kind of <laughs> fucked. Two weeks from today. Two weeks from today. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what we're going to do right now is play a pre-recorded episode or interview that I did with uh, Friedemann Fendersen, who is a really badass uh, European dude who writes uh, a book called The Addiction Formula, a holistic approach to writing captivating, memorable, and hit songs. He also has this badass YouTube channel called Holistic Songwriting, and it dude's pretty much a badass. So what we're going to do now is run that interview. Oh! Put her up. Put her up. <laughs> Joining us today is the award-winning songwriter and producer Friedemann Findison. Friedman is the creator of the Holistic Songwriting YouTube channel and podcast, and is the author of the best-selling book, The Addiction Formula, A Holistic Approach to Writing Captivating, Memorable Hit Songs. He holds a bachelor's degree in music and has written over 1,000 pieces of music in a wide variety of genres. He is frequently a guest speaker at conservatories all over Europe, and today he's here to chat a little bit about his concept of holistic songwriting. Thank you for understanding me butchering your name, and welcome to the show. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I think this is the best anyone's ever pronounced it. Thanks for the effort. <laughs> well, I, I try my best, but I have a terrible accent. So I guess I'd like to start a little bit, I guess, uh, talking about uh, your concept of holistic songwriting and what that means and um, just we'll just start from there sure so the idea behind holistic songwriting is that in this day and age where it's so easy to have access to software daws and all that stuff where it's so easy to have your own home studio and to do all of that stuff that labels used to do for you in the olden days all by yourself mm -hmm. uh, that it has become more and more important to do all of that stuff yourself so the diy idea has become more and more prominent in the last couple of years if you want to be a successful songwriter or musician um, that you have to be able to do all of this stuff yourself. And so the idea behind holistic songwriting is really teaching people not just songwriting technique, which is what a lot of other songwriting channels are doing or a lot of other books or what I learned in you know conservatory essentially. I want to teach people how everything is connected. So I'm more interested in the why behind decisions mm -hmm. than what you actually do eventually. Like, So I'm not really interested in the techniques. I'm more interested in your image and how that comes across to your listener. So... Uh, the way we come across in our music videos is just as important as what they hear through their speakers. So things like lighting become important, uh, makeup, whatever whatever you're wearing, uh, the cover of your album, all of that stuff plays a major part in um, today's music industry. And so uh, I want to focus on all of those things and sort of look at holistic uh, at songwriting uh, in a holistic fashion, so in a wholesome fashion, if you right. want to call it that. Yeah, kind of looking at the artist as the entire package, both visually, auditorily, and and song structure wise because I know that one of the the points that you make in uh, the book the addiction formula is this concept of lyricless storytelling you know with the the principles of anticipation and gratification being able to kind of tell a story without any words at all and um, could you like kind of go into a little more detail about that sure so uh, yeah in my book the addiction formula I talk about this idea that there is one formula that kind of unites all at least all American commercial music, and that is the idea of energy curves. Mm -hmm. So very basically, like at its very basic level, that is the idea that the verses should be low energy and the choruses should be high energy. Obviously, there's ways to, to flip that around and stuff like that. But, you know, basically, that's how it is. 
And um, there's the idea is that there's three different types of energy and there's three different ways that we can set those energies. And those are hype, tension, and imply tension. Those are the names I give that in the book. Mm-hmm. And uh, the idea is how can we set those energy levels so they make sense, so that they can guide our listener through the song, so they have an experience of a story even if they don't literally hear a story. Right. And it's kind of like uh, taking someone by the hand and, sh- and at each point in the song, sh- telling them, this is where you are right now. This is the chorus, and you're supposed to feel this way right now. And this is the bridge that you're supposed to feel this way right now. And uh, that can be really easily done with energy shifts. And when you place those energy shifts and when you should change energy and how much you should change and how you actually change energy, like what the actual um, techniques are for that, all of that is in the book. Very good, very good. Yeah, that's uh, that's something that we're kind of struggling with right now. I wish my bandmates were here today, but they were unavailable. But like while we're writing our songs, we we generally follow like the intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, maybe a solo, and then a double chorus at the end. Um, but mm. each time we're, we're we're writing these parts and coming up with stuff, our drummer keeps saying that just sounds like another verse. The chorus isn't big enough. There's not enough emotion there. And I guess for us, one of our um, I guess weaknesses is that we're high energy rock, so. You know, there's the, we start off at a high energy level and then we need to keep elevating and keep elevating, you know. So yeah. I don't know. Um, I know with, with pop music, there seems to be a lot more, you know, at least um, emotional dynamics, not so much sound anymore since everything is mastered to be loud as hell. Um, but <laughs> for I, I guess since you're also a songwriter, um, has uh, this process uh, or in this, this um, I guess, concept of the holistic um, angle, is it something that you've developed on your own or is it um, what is your songwriting pers- process personally like when you're writing for yourself or for other people oh yeah i mean this is definitely something that i picked up from listening to a lot of music um myself and obviously i use it in my own writing as well um i just i just think i think i noticed it first in conservatory i conservatory was a really great experience for me especially because i got to listen to a lot of not finished yet or you might call it bad music mm-hmm. <laughs> um, because it really teaches you what not to do and I heard a lot of people's songs just didn't understand these basic concepts of like the energy shifts and controlling energy. And so that really like got me thinking of like, how, what do I not like about these songs? Why are they not engaging me? Why am I not mm-hmm. feeling like I want to finish this song? And so what I often have when I listen to one of those kind of songs and a lot of songs that people send in to me through, I have like a feedback service as well on the site. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of times I will feel like after the first chorus or sometimes even earlier than that, man, I've, I've heard the song. Why would I keep listening? I feel it's just going to keep going like this for another two minutes. Right. What's, yeah. what's the point, you know? Gotcha. And so what you were mentioning, for example, um, of starting with high energy, that is a tricky thing to do because where are you going to go from there, as you said? Right. And so uh, what a lot of rock bands do, for example, is they'll, they'll have a high energy intro, but then they go way down for the verse. Because if you stay on the same energy level or go higher – then if you go higher, then you have nowhere to go for the chorus. And if you stay at the same level, it just gets boring. So we always want to change energy levels for each new section that we introduce. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Does that answer your question? Yes, it sure does. And like for you personally, what instruments do you uh, do you write on? Is it usually keys or you you like more of a, a DAW person laying out MIDI chords or are you a guitar guy? What do you what do you write on? Um, it really depends. I mean, I'm a guitarist by trade, but I'm also a singer. So a lot of my melodies uh, come up, I come up with in the car because I don't have a car radio, which is something that I think uh, not enough people don't have. <laughs> so because um, right. it forces me to make my own music in the car, and I think it's a great thing. Right. Um, I also write a lot in the DAW, like. The last couple of years, I would say I haven't really written on guitar. I mean, I still write on guitar every once in a while, especially when I'm writing rock songs or something that I want to have like a more gritty, like folk music or something like that. But when it comes to electronic music, pop music, I'm definitely going to start on the DAW using MIDI keyboards or my my synthesizers. Um, I also have written songs that just started with a chord progression. Like if I'm writing something that is very where the harmony plays a big role, like jazz music or orchestral music, then mm. typically I will start with chords or figuring out like what's the what's the kind of harmonic the harmonic flow going to be. So right. it really depends on the project. Yeah. And then um, when you sit down to write, you already have like a concept in mind. You do just kind of like experiment a little and like just see what 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 feels right. Or um, like, do you uh, approach like a writing session with a lyric with lyrics in mind, or does it start with emotions? I guess. 
That is a great question. I, I really think this is a great question because so a couple of years ago, b- before holistic songwriting, I gave this workshop at my conservatory about um, concepting and music. And back then, I really believed that concepting was this really important thing that you had to kind of know what your song was going to sound like exactly before you even start producing or exactly writing it. You know, you have to have mm-hmm. the story in mind and you have to know where it goes energy wise, etc. You have to know what it's supposed to feel like to your audience. And I've since really come back from that point. And I, because what happened to me after that, after I gave that workshop, there was a lot of pressure on myself for actually following my own principles. And I realized Mm -hmm. it was limiting me more than it was actually helping me. And since then, I've started to really um, try to find the spontaneity in the writing again. And uh, so I did this internship with uh, Jeff Rona, a, a composer from LA, uh, for a couple of months. And, uh, I thought it was really amazing how, little he seemed to be thinking about what he was doing he literally just wrote mm. and he he really seemed to rely on his instincts and some really cool things came from that and i think that's also a kind of a sound designer's uh, mindset i guess as a sound designer you have to try out a lot of things before you find the one sound that sounds right, right. Mm-hmm. so I, i'm sure it was tied to that but for me it was really like eye-opening to that it's possible to write like that and to be a really great writer at that Right. Yeah. I guess it kind of it disengages your your analytical mind and like it, it gets more down to just free expression. And uh, yeah, exactly. Which is why you, you you know you write your best songs when you're tired or when you're drunk or right. some people write when they're high. You know, it's typically right. when uh, when you're the when your mind is you know not. Uh, not engaged so much when you right. typically write your best stuff. Yeah, I, I recently I'm reading a book. Um, I forget what it's called now. Darn it! it, it basically, the concept is um, learning how to be bored again. Um, but they define boredom as you know the default state of your mind, where it's not really working on any problems. It's just kind of there, kind of. Uh, just in its default mode where there's no extra like uh, hardcore analytics going through. And that's where the flow state can be engaged. And is, just... is this uh, the net and the butterfly? Um, no, but there are butterflies on the book. It is. Oh, <laughs> damn it. I'll, I'll send you a link in through email, but it's, it's a pretty cool book. Sounds very interesting. I'd love to read it. Yeah. Um, it's like uh, something about the art of boredom or learning to be bored, something about that. But yeah, it's, it's, cool. a, it's right, a cool right. book. But um, anyway, a lot of uh, we've we've spoken to other musicians who um, both um, do things more structured and also ones that just kind of uh, kind of freeform it. And um, it seems like there's uh, that a lot of the best ideas come out of the space where you're not really thinking, you're just kind of feeling. I mean, and like jazz improv- improvisation is you know a perfect example of that. Um, so. Um, yeah, I, th- I think you just get kind of bo- like I get kind of bored with my own ideas. If I've already right. chewed through everything, like once I actually sit down t- to start writing, I'm like, oh, you know, I already know where this is going to like what I'm doing. So this is it's the the process of actually writing it down becomes really boring. Right. And um, I always get bored of my stuff really quickly, which is why I have to write my songs quickly as well. Right. I'm, but if I just come up with it in the in the spur of the moment, typically my songs are are more streamlined. They're simpler. They don't mutate as much. Right. And you're not judging them. They're just they're there. Do, yeah. you, do you write collaboratively ever, or is it always uh, you um, on your own? Yeah, I do. I mean, there's some projects like you know, I'll have projects where people just send over like a hook and say like, "Hey, I just came up with this, and it sounds like a like it's up your alley. Could you do something with this?" And I'll send them back something, you know, a couple of hours later. Or I have a friend uh, that I write with quite regularly. Actually, um, we used to be in a band together, which didn't really work out, but we still write together quite a bit for some German artists that are pretty popular here um so yeah i mean it's it's a little bit of everything really but a lot of it is obviously just writing by myself gotcha and um to backtrack a little bit about um like we spoke a little bit about production um can a great song have crappy production or does it kind of fall apart (laughs) because you're not looking at it as the whole piece (laughs) yeah i think I mean, it has to have a certain standard. There is really bad production. It can really ruin a song. It really can. Mm-hmm. And it also depends on the type of song. It really does depend on the type of song. There are certain, like, for example, a ballad, if the production isn't, you know, right on par, it's really going to ruin the song because those kind of songs that are supposed to give you goosebumps, goosebumps is like, that's a, such a subtle kind of feeling mm-hmm. to achieve that. You really need all the subtlety you can. 
Um, and production is such a great way to induce that. Like with the right kind of reverb, the right kind of EQing, that has such a tremendous impact on people, especially with songs like that. Now, when it comes to something like, um, I, I want to say a rock song, but even rock songs need, need the mm -hmm. impact. And that's, that, you know, it needs a great production. There are some, some styles like maybe folk music where sometimes the, right. the fan base, embraces that idea of something not being perfect i for example i really love uh, bands like you know or artists like damien rice or bon Iver that have this kind of crappy sound but that's exactly the kind of ch uh, charm that i right, like yeah it's something that i really cherish about those kind of like artists that crappiness is part of the production which gives you more of the you know feeling of the whole thing yeah it's like exactly listen, yeah, it sounds like nothing else too right yeah like listening to like some of the first like audio recordings of like old blues musicians and stuff it's just them in a room with a guitar and you can't it's mm. it's very muddy but it's you know they're brilliant because you know it's it's you put your mindset there that you know this is how they captured it and this is what makes it bu brilliant um true so do you um we talked a little bit about um you know your pre-production um process um but like say for a band or a mus or like when you work with a, a musician or an artist um do you have uh, extensive pre-production meetings with them or how like what's your process for pre-production i guess working for yourself and with other people well, I I try to get to know the person a little bit, and um, you know sometimes like like I'm gonna be honest with you, a lot of the pitches that we get, I just like get an email. I don't get get to meet the person. I just get an email in my inbox, and it says like, "Hey, we want this to sound like this. The the possible themes are this. If if it's even that, like sometimes it's just like, "Hey, we need a new new song for this and this and that artist." And then here's her last couple of singles, and then I'm supposed to figure that all out by myself. <laughs> um, but you know, usually you have you know a little bit better pitch where it will tell you the. These are the kind of subjects, the kind of themes that we're interested in. Musically, it's supposed to be something like, like you know, and they'll give examples like Katy Perry's last song or whatever, you know, it's that kind of thing. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, it's just a lot of listening to their other singles to try to figure out who they are as a, what their image is, essentially what I'm talking a lot about this artist series that I'm doing on YouTube and to try to get behind that and then to write something in that vein. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. And is there, um, have you ever had any production, um, situations where someone was very difficult to work with? Um, I, I guess this more applies to like in the studio, but since you work remotely, is there, um, a, a point where you were just like, I have to fire this artist or this, this, uh, label or whatever, because they're just too difficult to work with. And how do you handle like, the, um, I guess disagreements? Well, so, so the way it works for me is typically I write the song and produce a demo and then the the artist or the you know uh, whoever it is the the team behind the artist is, takes the song usually reproduces it and uh, pr records it with the singer and then I get to hear it essentially like I don't have that much say in this in the final version uh, sometimes I do but you know very few artists or teams actually send over like a version to check with me if, if I'm okay with it that's oh, just yeah. typically how it is for me uh, that being said I do have a lot of situations where I'm recording with musicians in the studio obviously and yeah it can get difficult especially if you have someone. Uh, especially if you're working with uh, musicians that aren't so skilled or mm -hmm. that uh, where it becomes more of a game about motivation and making sure they don't quit on you. And because it, it can take quite a long while, especially if you're not so skilled in the studio, it can take a long time before you get that perfect take. And I've, I've sat in the studio for sometimes hours, like maybe eight hours to, to record one or two lines. Right. And yep. it, um, <laughs> that can be, you know, it's a wear and tear on your artist, obviously, especially if it's singing, which, you know, yeah. damage mm -hmm. after, after a while, your vocal cords are going to get tired, et cetera. Yeah. We, um, yeah, we're, we're famous for our, our guitarist, um, in his solos taking, um, you know, tens and tens, sometimes hundreds of takes to get it just right. But when he, <laughs> when he nails it, it's, it's beautiful, you know, it's magic. Um, but, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so, um, when you coming back to songwriting, um, we, we talked a little bit about emotion and, um, and the pre-production process of like kind of either letting it go or coming to the table with like a, an idea, um, how much do you as the, the, I guess, the songwriter or the producer um, focus on the intended audience at that point? Like, uh, is that, like, when you sit down to go, you're like, this is who my audience is and this is who I'm writing for? Or does it kind of evolve as the project is going? 
Ah, uh, it does play a big part for sure, but it's, uh, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I, there's a, there's a few points in the songwriting process where I'll check back with the artist. And I'll just like keep, I'll just, you know, throw up YouTube or something and, and listen to mm-hmm. their last song again and be like, okay, so this is kind of what it needs to be. And then return back to my song. And every once in a while, I need a, a checkup like that to make sure that I'm still going in the right direction. Um, it's that for sure. Then it's also uh, a lot of it is is listening to lyrics and figuring out like what's the kind of words they use. You know, for example, I I recently wrote a, a German Schlager, which is something I'm not proud of. <laughs> um, it's I'm sure it's fantastic. Oh, uh, it's, it's like I mean, you you must have heard you you you've been to Cologne, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, that's it's fun. You know, <laughs> it's, it's fun music, right? <laughs> not if you know what the lyrics mean. Oh, okay. Um, so. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> no, it's uh, I think it's also pretty terrible music um but anyways <laughs> it's a that's my personal opinion yeah which is fun. um so um yeah so there are certain words that are used in, the, in those styles and the, those words are different than what you would hear in a german rock or pop song right yeah, yeah so it's yeah. figuring that out and for me it's really difficult to write for example german schlager because i find it extremely cheesy mm-hmm. and but there is still and Ed, you can still go too far. Like, it, so, mm-hmm. so this this artist that I was writing for was she was a little bit she's a little bit younger, but she's still a Schlager artist. Mm-hmm. And so our first version. So this is something I wrote together with uh, with Jenny, my my co writer. And um, so the first version was incredibly cheesy. And then we listened back to her, and, and we realized, oh, you know what? This isn't actually that cheesy. Like it's a little more modern. And so it's like we had to dial it down again. There were some lines that we had to take out and like replace with new lines. Mm-hmm. It was still cheesy at the end, but um yeah. we had to definitely it was, dial it down. It was too good. It was a little no, too it was, good. it was too horrible. Oh, okay. Like um, <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. So yeah, we dialed we dialed that back down. Like it was it was cringe worthy. The first version was really cringe worthy. The second one was still cringe worthy, but not but, as horrible, but passable. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so there's uh, that, that was actually leads into my next question is like, how do you know when your song is done and it's time to stop revising? Because with you know digital recording, you can keep on going and keep on going like ad nauseum. So when do you decide this is this is the song um, when it's you know when you're not just writing it and passing it off to another artist to record um, and produce? When do you know that your song is done and in the can and ready to move on? Well, it's never done, is it? Uh, <laughs> Correct. At some point, just you just need a deadline. At some point, you just got to say like, tomorrow it's got to be done, or you know, I this I want this song to release on that date, and so until that date, it's got to be done. Right. And uh, that's really the only thing that helps me because you know we, I think all musicians are perfectionists, which in, typically means in musician talk we want it to sound exactly the way we have it in our heads. Right. Mm-hmm. And um. So that's almost impossible. Like the the better you get as a producer, obviously the the easier that gets. But it's it's still it's not possible to reach exactly what you have in your head because it's always you know a fantasy version of your song. Right. Yeah. The, um, the perfect so idea. At some point you just gotta stop. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. At some point you just gotta stop. There's there, there comes a point when you gotta be reasonable and say like you know what I've said it long, long enough with this song. You know everyone I've shown it to likes it, so I should just let this go. Right. It's fine. Let it. And uh, what is your DAW of choice? Where do you work in? So I uh, I tried a, a bunch of DAWs uh, in conservatory. I tried uh, uh, Pro Tools, and I've recently bought Ableton Live. I also have Studio One or Studio One Three, rather. I also tried a Cubase, but the one that I keep coming back to is Logic Pro X for some reason. It's just the one. Well, for some reason, I think the reason is that I know all the shortcuts, and I'm incredibly fast in it. Like I've just, it's just right. like a mm-hmm. like a third hand for me. You know, it's just everything just makes sense in it. I just know where everything is, and I can produce a song in the matter of maybe an hour or so. Like, not a great sounding song, but like I can lay out this, the track and have your arrangement ready. Right, and then um, yeah, it seems to be a common theme. It's like whatever you 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 learned first and became comfortable with and got fast. It's the one you stick with, no matter if someone else can do it a little quicker and someone else is like, nope, this is my process. Um, yeah, when, when true. You- but that being said, though, Ableton Live is probably the best DAW on the market right now. Yeah. I will go as far as saying that it is it is incredible what you can do with audio, especially if you're into electronic music oh, yeah. and live music. Obviously, then mm-hmm. Ableton Live is the software to go with. But I, I have a couple of producer friends here in Germany that also that only produce rock bands and they only arrange in Ableton Live. And um, mm. yeah, it's just the, a matter of what you can do with sound. Ableton Live has so many good algorithms for pitch shifting, tempo stretching, all that kind of stuff. Right. It's just so amazing in yeah. Ableton Live and right out of the box too. You know, you don't have to add True. in a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah. 
when you uh, when you were studying in school, did you learn uh, on all digital equipment, or was there a mix of uh, analog and digital? Have you ever worked with reel to reel tape and a big old fashioned console with the? No, it was all in the box. Mm -hmm. Like it's all digital, pretty much. I mean, we had some analog gear standing around, but. Uh, very few of us actually like dare to touch them. Right. And I just like, I just never, it was really ever something that really interested me. I mean, I have two synthesizers, like analog synthesizers now. Um, um, but it's, you know, it's just a matter of, uh, of price as well. Like I, right. it, yeah. these things are so expensive and what you got in the box is so, so good these days that right. you don't really need it. Mm -hmm. Like for me, it's like now that I have a little bit of money after, you know, finished my studies, it's definitely, it's more fun to twist knobs and press actual keys. That's definitely more fun than, you know, program it, programming some piano roll notes or whatever, mm -hmm. which is why I, you know, I have those two synthesizers, but I don't think I'm going to get another one. I don't, I think yeah. it's really just a luxury item at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the digital stuff is comparable and, you know, I mean, a lot of audiophiles say they can hear a difference. They're lying most of the time, but yeah, <laughs> I it's, think so. it's a kind of an experience thing too. Cause yeah, I'm, uh, I've recorded both ways and you know, my, my studio is all digital we record in a in an analog um digital mix studio usually so yeah it's um there's so many options there and the prices to entry has gone s so far down that yeah anybody yeah. can can get into this kind of thing but that doesn't mean that they're uh, they're any good at it it takes time it takes practice and it takes uh, yeah. i guess in a holistic approach to uh uh to songwriting um so where can people find your book the addiction formula uh is it so they can find it on Amazon. Uh, there's also a Kindle, Kindle version and an Audible version available if they'd rather listen to it in their car. And I recommend the audio version, actually, because that has audio examples and is and it's the most recent version. Cool. So the Addiction Formula was written in 2015. The Audible version is from last year or this year. No, it's from last year, 2017, like the end of 2017. Nice. Are you the narrator um, or did you is someone else narrate that? No, I'm also narrating it. Nice, because yeah. you have a fantastic voice. I, I got to say, like your <laughs> your YouTube channel and your 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 podcast and just your your speaking voice is very very good. And um, yeah, it's captivating. So I, man, I'm gonna have to check out the Audible version. Ask for it by name, kids. <laughs> <So funny>. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, exactly. That's awesome. So I guess um, um, another question. I, like you deal mostly in like pop music, um, where like it seems like the single is the you know the big unit. Um, do you think that the album in general is dead and we've gone back to just singles or? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, just as if you just look at it as a marketing tool, like, cause that's what it is at this point. It's, right. it's not the central thing anymore. If you look at music as your business, music is not the central thing. You're not selling your music. You're selling merchandise. You're selling uh, gigs. You're selling, right. you know, VIP tickets or whatever. That's what you're selling as a musician. Um, and so the, so in that sense, it's like an ad that you put somewhere, right? The music becomes a piece of like a, an advertising essentially for all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Just if you look at it like that, like very abstract. Um, and in that case, it just makes the most sense to have, instead of having 11 songs on an album that no one's going to buy and releasing two or three of those songs as, 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 ad, ad, uh, as ads, essentially, mm -hmm. um, it makes more sense to release six or you know, even go the, go as far as releasing eleven singles, because that is eleven ways that you could interact or connect with an audience. Whereas if you only release three, well, you know, it's only a fourth of you know having an entire album as singles essentially. And you can always, uh, after the fact, s decide, hey, you know what, those three songs or those four songs were really well uh, received by my audience. So you know what, let's just put those on an EP. Right. And I yeah. think mm -hmm. that's how it should work nowadays. That you do that after the fact when you realize, okay, these songs here work well together people are willing to would probably be willing to buy for that if they want to support us and then that's something that you can sell through your newsletter or your homepage or whatever right or yeah. your gigs. and i guess some genres are more apt to buy like vinyl versus cds and some are still digital and some don't buy at all you know we, we the streaming the streaming is king right now so yeah, yeah that's that's fun so i guess one more question this is this may be well out of your wheelhouse but i we like to ask it to everybody if you had to choose one band you can only choose one Iron Maiden oh. or Judas Priest? Who would it be? 
That's a difficult one. I would say Iron Maiden, probably. Yes. <laughs> I, would, I would say Iron Maiden. Nice. Okay. I have. Jesus. I have. Sorry, I have a wall of Iron Maiden posters in my studio, <laughs> and everyone. I, I love both bands, and it's just become kind of a funny joke. Um, it's it's an icebreaker at the end of the interview, which makes no sense, but that's how we do stuff. Um, but most people have said Judas Priest. So, um, <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> I'm glad to have another um, Maiden uh, fan. <laughs> on the show yes so. i'm the first I'm very the first good the, the wall of shame yes. there we go <laughs> all right so where can people find you online uh please plug your blog your twitter your youtube plug it all please uh so the three things i would recommend is check out the the youtube channel because that's where all the good stuff is that's where most people know me from i do a show called the artist series where i analyze different artists and connect back all that they're doing to one image so um for example, if you want to check out one of my videos, check out um, how Ed Sheeran writes a melody. And the YouTube channel itself is called Holistic Songwriting with a space in the middle. So Holistic Space Songwriting. Um, there's also a Holistic Songwriting Live channel, which is spelled exactly the same way, just with L-I-V-E at the end, also with a space. Um, and there, every Monday at, uh, at 9 a.m. PST, I do a live Q&A, so everyone who has any questions about songwriting um, can just jump on a live chat and ask me anything, and I will answer every question within that I can within one hour. And the third uh, resource that I'd give you is holisticsongwriting.com, and you can spell that whichever way you like, with a dash in the middle or not, uh, and it's going to bring you to my blog where I have a, you know several um, content pieces. You'll also find some of my courses there. You can also buy the addiction formula through there uh, if you want to take it a step further. But there's also just a bunch of free stuff and you, you know, you, there's a podcast that you can check out and all of that good stuff. Well, very good. Friedman, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and we will drive everybody to all your online platforms so they can check everything out. Um, thanks so much and you have a lovely after... I guess it's evening. Have a lovely evening, sir. <laughs> thanks, man. Right. You too. Right. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Well, that'll do it for this episode of Idiots with Instruments. I am Jim Tramontana, bassist in Lilo, and I'm reminding you to stay hydrated. I'm Dougie J. Keep it simple. I am uh, Andres, and uh, don't, what is it, don't play acoustic. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Idiots with Instruments is a solid arts and science production. All rights reserved throughout the multiverse. Please subscribe and review the show on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Visit idiotswithinstruments.com for exclusive bonus material and to support or sponsor this show.